Uh, hi, everyone. So thanks for coming into the last day uh, of the conference. So welcome, everyone, to the session on how we can break barriers to build a truly global open source community. Uh, my name is Nikita, and I am uh, mainly involved in the CNCF and Kubernetes communities. I'm the vice chair of the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee. Uh, I'm also one of the chairs of the KubeCon conference, and I'm a Kubernetes maintainer. Hi, uh, I'm Rajus. Uh, I'm involved in the CNCF Technical Advisory Group for Runtime. I'm a tech lead there. Um, I have also contributed to Kubernetes before. Uh, I write YAML for a living, and off late, I've been hanging out in the Artificial Intelligence Working Group in CNCF. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, all of our opinions in this talk are ours and do not reflect those of our employer. Uh, so we just wanted to uh, get that out. And the other thing is we are mostly acquainted with the CNCF and the Kubernetes communities. So the examples that we're going to display in the talk are mostly related to those communities. But can we extend it to your community? Yeah. So let's get started. So talking about global communities in this digital universe where maintainers are trying to make this world a better place through open source, uh, we are faced with multiple barriers, which we are going to address today. But first, let's take a quick look at what they are. So the Thanos of this open source universe is shaped by maintainer burnout. <laughs> And the recent situation uh, with the XZ backdoor is a great example of why maintainer burnout should not be taken for granted. So when we talk about global communities, its essence lies in diversity. And when we'll talk about diversity, there'll be barriers around it. Language barrier is one of those. Um, what, the other thing is the financial support to carry out open source or to get paid uh, to do open source. So to fight all of these dark energies, we need superpowers. So just like there are infinity stones, we have something called as OSPO stones in the open source universe. So what are OSPO stones? These are open source power origin stones, which reflect the idea of power and potential that comes from global open source communities. So let's take a look at the first infinity stone, which is called the Mind Stone. The Mind Stone controls minds, enhances users' intelligence, and creates new lives. Uh, and similarly, possessing the Mentorship Stone helps us mentor new contributors. So what makes open source really so successful is that all of us are selfish. Yes, you heard that right, selfish. So we've benefited so much from open source that we want it to continue to last in the next decade and more. So we paid forward by taking more strategic responsibilities. And at the same time, we mentor new contributors. So it is mentorship which actually keeps open source sustainable. And as of, uh, even in my career, as I've taken up more responsibility, so one key thing on my mind is like how do I mentor someone to replace me which brings me to the various mentorship programs that are available in the Linux Foundation like the Google Summer of Code for students Google season of docs uh, for contributors to docs the uh, outreachy uh, mentorship program to target women and other underrepresented groups in tech and finally the LFX mentorship program which uh, one of the best parts over here is that the mentees can be both full-time employees as well as students and the Linux Foundation has also published data on the LFX uh, program in a report where it shows that contributors have been contributing to various projects like be it CNCF, lower level kernel features or other advanced topics like blockchain as well. And, but what's really, truly fascinating about this internship program is how it's uplifting people's day-to-day -day lives. So more than half of the mentees have mentioned that they identify as someone from a lower middle class background and how participating in this program has helped them increase their income. Uh, and with more and more projects participating in, prog in this program, we as maintainers get to do a small part in making open source more equitable and accessible uh, for people to break down the barriers. And now this barriers can be, these barriers can be uh, language, uh, background, and one of the important things we need to also remember here is the financial, financial situation among others. While uh, we see that most mentees are from Asia Pacific, it's also clear that these mentorship programs are wading their way through geographical barriers as well. 
So talking about representation from the uh, APEC mentees, here's, uh, here's an example of the mentorship program from the, from the Kubernetes uh, release team. So the Kubernetes community runs a release shadow program wherein people can join the release team as shadows for such as CI health, docs, enhancements, and so on and so forth. So in this scenario, uh, Priyanka, who is part of the release team, actually got on to be the release lead for 129 Kubernetes release. Just yesterday, we had the 130 uh, Kubernetes release come out as well. Uh, so this shows that the importance of running mentorship programs uh, basically helps people get in the community and basically get named roles in the community. Uh, shifting gears from Kubernetes to the CNCF side of things. So in CNCF, we have something called as technical advisory group. Uh, and I'm involved in the technical advisory group for runtime. So here's an, uh, here's an example of how we got new co-chairs for the tag runtime in CNCF. So the day-to-day uh, -day operations in uh, tag runtime involve reaching out to projects, uh, helping projects with their technical roadmap, uh, providing recommendations to the technical oversight committee in CNCF on like projects graduating to different levels, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of this requires consistency, it requires showing up, and a lot of it is non-glorious work. Um, so it so happened that at KubeCon Chicago, Stephen Rust, uh, who's actually mentioned over here, reached out to us, came to the CNCF Tag Runtime Maintainer session, and showed interest that they would like to get involved in Tag Runtime. Uh, when that happened, they, we, after the KubeCon, they actually showed up to the meetings, they started contributing to Tag Runtime, and just over a month ago, they actually got involved, I mean, they got, they got nominated as, and then elected as the uh, co-chairs for Tag Runtime along with Daniel. Uh, so by hard work, consistently showing up, so on and so forth. So it, it bas they basically went from KubeCon Chicago to KubeCon Paris, and then eventually joined us. Um, We've also had contributor bandwidth issues with, uh, so with more people coming along, this really helps in sharing the load. So the, the essence of this is like, don't shy away from letting people know your aspirations and uh, your uh, basically what you would like to do uh, or get involved in communities and so on and so forth. You never know what opportunity may come forward to you. Uh, so now moving away from the mentorship stone, which creates new life, uh, the power stone is the one that increases energy and strength. So in the open source universe, you're calling it the leadership stone, which improves skills to build the next generation of leaders. So uh, in the Kubernetes project, I was one of the technical leads for a special interest group, uh, or SIG, called Contributor Experience. And we had two technical leads and two chairs for the SIG. Uh, and we noticed initially that there were a lot of drive-by contributors, but we were unable to convert any of them into leaders. So we decided that it was worth setting up a dedicated leadership shadow program, uh, similar to the re release shadow program that Rajas just talked about. Uh, and we found out that the program actually paid great dividends, and we found not just one, but four people to replace us all, including Madhav, who's sitting right here. He's one of the TLs uh, for the SIG right now. So with uh, setting up a dedicated mentorship program, it helped us in investing focused efforts towards knowledge transfer and also providing personalized guidance to the aspiring leaders. And we realized that this personalized guidance part was very, very crucial especially in open source, because technical leadership in open source, it's just not about the technical aspects. It's about conflict resolution, where you have contributors coming in from various companies who may have divergent agendas. So learning how to navigate these conflicting interests and fostering collaboration between all of these stakeholders to find a common ground is also something we need to uh, keep in mind while we mentor new leaders. Uh, additionally, as a leader for an open source project, you end up as the main voice representing it. So in the roles I've held, I have faced really challenging situations where I've had to represent the project and navigate public relations crises uh, with diplomacy and tact. So learning how to discern valuable feedback from all the noise and respond appropriately, it's been so instrumental in both managing these negative opinions that come up and also maintaining the integrity of the community and the project. 
so all of these leadership skills of up, 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 uplifting others around you providing strategic directions uh, communicating with diplomacy and tact and conflict resolution are some of the many ideas that help you flourish in open source and also form the zenith of the open source culture and so this is exactly why you should be the agent of osmosis to take this culture back to your enterprise environment to share the open source goodness uh, start delegating tasks and uh, succeed in your okr so it's just like what we call a road map they call okr so it's just a matter of optics at the end of the day uh so this is the infinity stone which basically alters reality and we're calling it the paid open source stone to alter our reality to get paid to do all of the open source work that we do uh so while while maintainers get recognition in keynotes or tweets and social media uh, that's that's not enough like what they really want is to get paid to uplift their life uh, we need more vendors to come forward who basically uh, draw revenue from open source to come forward and invest more in this direction right and as a maintainer explaining to your boss why you should be contributing to open source during work hours is so hard so if you go and tell them hey like i i think i should really work on this feature because if we contribute to it uh this will be really beneficial for a product it's good but it might not yield you great responses so what we really need to do here is instead change the narrative to a language that execs can understand so we need to focus more on impacts to businesses and business risks and resources uh, and talk about the risks and opportunities versus the engineering hours that are spent uh, in terms of the actual bottom line in terms of dollars and so on so what can also help is focusing on customer trust uh, and make it clear how if you don't invest in open source it can be a p0 risk to the company its uh, shareholders and customers and so on so safeguarding customer trust means that we design our products and projects efficiently to ensure that our customers are protected from adverse outcomes and unwanted surprises so we have the upstream expertise and most importantly karma in the community so if we get like a zero escalation or a major bug in an open source project or our dependencies then our customers have the confidence in us that we have the means to debug the issue uh now while some execs actually end up buying this argument to and allow uh setting up headcount for hiring for op open source roles retention is actually very hard most engineers also find themselves only getting promoted if they work on non open source activities so we need to remember to give engineers time to actually contribute to open source during work hours so they don't burn out and can have a decent work life balance now it's also clear that open source is defining the charter of what's happening in the industry so in the infra domain cloud native is leading the way and everyone wants a seat at the cloud native table where the decisions are made so as an established technical leader you get that seat for your employer so while you work for the betterment of the community your employer still gets a channel to voice out their cloud native opinions at that table through you Uh, and this is actually very nuanced and something we really need to remember because this might not come up in statistics around github contributions or spreadsheets but it has a fair share of intrinsic value add to your company's credibility within the industry now using these arguments and more has also helped us encourage more open source contributors from india uh, there's still a lot more to the to do this uh, to do in this regard for sure uh, but we're taking baby steps to break down some of these barriers so overall uh, keep in mind to once speak the language of the execs when you're talking about how to justify uh, open source contributions uh, it's not just about hiring and head counts but also retention and consistency and third as a maintainer remember that uh, your employer gets a seat at the open source table through you uh coming back to the infinity stones uh the time stone is the one which uh, helps in controlling and manipulating time uh we're calling it the time zone stone uh in open source so to communicate uh, effectively across time zones um so no one wants to attend late night meetings right like this reality does not exist <laughs> uh 
when it when it comes to community meetings, time zones and uh, a distributed community, uh, especially with a distributed community, time zones play a huge challenge. Uh, what we want to highlight over here is while these challenges exist, there should not be any guilt systems, but instead try to set up success systems. Uh, what do I mean by success system? So let's take a look at some examples over here. Uh, so here's an example. So do not feel guilty about me missing a late night meeting. Instead, try to bump your async communication skills. Uh, go through the meeting agenda before the meeting, add your notes. Uh, add what all you want to speak at the meeting in the agenda, in the doc. After the meeting, follow up, uh, to reply to people on the Slack, like actually uh, take a look at what happened in the meeting. Basically make sure uh, that you communicate well what time that you uh, work, uh, wh when uh, people are expected to you know, get responses from you. In this way, you're not missing out on any of that happens in uh, the meeting, right? So. so do not have the guilt, but instead try to use that to bump uh, your async communication skills. Uh, this will also be sustainable and you can get your work done uh, efficiently. This is an example wherein uh, there was a blog post series uh, conducted by uh, for Meet Our Contributors particularly in APAC. So this was done by the Kubernetes community um, uh, mostly for APAC uh, contributors. Uh, it was actually challenging to get interviewing, uh, basically get interviews for people, like, you know, get them uh, to speak on videos and things like that. Some some people had challenges to actually speak in English on video and stuff like that. Uh, the idea over here was to carry out all of these interviews async, right? So this is one way where the community comes to help you uh, to deal with all of these challenges. Another example of a success system uh, is to not have FOMO for not having a meeting in your time zone. Instead, you try to host a meeting in your time zone, right? Um, a lot of people, when they are uh, located in APAC, EU-friendly time zones, having attending early morning P uh, Pacific time zone meetings becomes really hard, right? So here's an example where the Kubernetes release team started an APAC EU-friendly meeting for the release team. Uh, so that everyone could cl uh, co collaborate round the uh, round the clock, right? Uh, another example uh, of a success system is while we have talked about uh, communicating effectively, uh, language barrier still stands over here, right? Beat async communication, so on, so on, uh, so on and so forth. So instead, try to take advantage of the localization efforts. Uh, so these are some examples wherein the Kubernetes documentation has been localized in languages such as Portuguese, Spanish, Hindi, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, so on and so forth. There's a great talk from KubeCon Valencia, uh, which talks about removing language barriers for sp uh, Spanish speaking uh, professionals. It, it actually goes into the avenues of what the community provides and how you can help community back right, like uh, to localize all of these uh, efforts. Uh, the Kubernetes documentation is also available in various languages. Uh, there's Kubernetes community forums, which are also localized in various languages. Uh, so this is just an example of the what Kubernetes community is doing. The idea is you should also be able to take it back to your open source community and try to extend it over there so you can have localization efforts uh, if, if, if it works for you in your uh, open source community. Uh, to, to, to sum it up, while there have been efforts from the community on localization of docs and, you know, from people from various uh, continents uh, contributing with la various languages, here's an example of how local leadership also comes into the picture. So this was a message that was delivered by Shi and Aki to Kubete Japan uh, about the wonderful Kubernetes community. So uh, moving on, the Space Stone uh, creates portals to teleport to conferences. Uh, so since teleporting is still quite a dream, traveling to conferences like this is quite nuanced. So first of all, funding for conferences is so extremely complicated and challenging. So a big shout out to all employers that are funding their employees to attend and speak at these events. 
without employer support traveling to conferences is can be incredibly hard uh, so for various parts of the world traveling to cube conferences almost requires them spending 25% of their annual income to get there imagine taking 25% of your family's needs and spending it on a single event so to tackle these challenges we have three ways today so one is through scholarships provided by the linux foundation and cncf uh, the other is speaker travel grants grants and us uh, funds and finally the third one is companies sponsoring their employees uh, while uh, past scholarships uh, to kubecons uh, show that they offer to need based individuals we also seeing now that most companies in fact are not funding these conferences anymore and they are requiring their employees to resort to these scholarships so this eventually takes away opportunities from individuals who are actually need based like students and who cannot afford to make it to these conferences at all now even if you get a scholarship the barriers actually don't stop here for a big part of the world they need visas to travel to these events and getting a visa slot in the first place is a major hassle and we've seen instances where folks prepare their presentations get a slot but then working through all those paperwork and logistics they cannot just get a visa back in time so one win that we have here is that as a kubecon co-chair i also worked with the cncf events team to ensure that we announce the scholarship results earlier uh, just of uh, any eight weeks before the uh, kubecon conference so that people can at least start planning for their visa sooner and we actually found that it helped people uh, to plan the visas uh, better and make it to the conference and we've also seen communities coming together and helping each other navigate these processes so a huge shout out to the indev uh, community of the kubernetes slack so this slack channel is for indian contributors to kubernetes um and one of the way, ways to work around this issue is to encourage more local conferences so in the cloud native community kcds or kubernetes community days are conferences that are organized in each geographical region and we're seeing a tremendous turnout at these events so it's clear that people are interested in participating in these conferences but it's the accessibility to these bigger events that have been inhibiting them in the past Uh, so while a lot of people are attending conferences uh, we also seen that a very few people actually get the most out of it right uh, so we we see a lot of people actually uh, taken over by small talk instead of actually um, getting actionable uh, outcomes from hallway track discussions and things like that so here's one approach that i would like to suggest uh, So when you enter a, a hallway track discussion or a conference room, uh, try to gauge the net worth of the room or the hallway track, right? Like, say everyone in this room makes like fifty bucks an hour or something along those lines, and based on that, try to try to get a fair idea of what the room is worth, and then try to see what conversations conversations that you're having in the room to actually see whether it's worth the people's time or not. Uh, the idea is to be In, to be intentional in your conversations try to have an agenda before you come to the conference try to research the speakers of the talks that you are going to attend try to have some questions in mind before you go for the talk so that you can actually talk to all of these people if you are going to going to attend any uh, technical talks which are given by maintainers try to and if you want to get involved in those projects try to actually see what sort of contributions you may be interested in try to reach out to those maintainers after the talk the idea is to not uh, basically just land in a conference and then figure your way out but also uh, have an agenda before you land there try to research some aspects and try to get most out of it right while uh, all of this can sound overwhelming uh, one idea over here is to have a buddy right with you some seasoned contributor some seasoned uh, maintainer who knows the way around to navigate around a conference right try to find someone along with you so that it becomes easier to say have intros to basically network with people you know try to get the most out of the conferences so on and so forth okay so coming to the last uh, infinity stone of our discussion uh, it's the soul stone which manipulates the soul and essence of a person and we're calling it the empathy stone uh, you know to make us more empathetic and inclusive in global open source communities 
So while we put a lot of emphasis on improving diversity in general, let's remember that true progress actually comes when we when we're not only inviting diverse voices to the table, but we're also giving them a meaningful seat. So being truly inclusive means that you're letting people speak, but you're actually also listening to them. So, and we also need to learn how to be more empathetic. For instance, we need to remember that someone from another part of the world might not really understand the pop culture references that you're speaking about. So be mindful about the languages and examples that you use. Uh, and this will help us to get one step towards breaking down barriers to make a truly globally friendly open source community. Uh, the other important aspect that we should keep in mind is representation. Uh, imagine you're entering a room that looks like this. Uh, this can be quite daunting as compared to a room that looks like this. Uh, so representation plays a huge role in community. This not only uh, helps contributors feel comfortable, but uh, they can also have someone who looks like them in the room, right? Uh, this gives them enough motivation and inspiration to take up new roles. This, this really helps to uplift the community. So let's remember to be kind uh, in, everything do, uh, in everything we do. Okay, so homework for y'all to summarize all of the uh, OSPO stones uh, that we've talked about. First is the mentors. Stone. So if you are a mentee, look out for the various opportunities that are available. And if you are a mentor, remember to be selfish. So take new responsibilities to, responsibilities to grow yourself and grow the ecosystem. But also remember to grow others to replace you. Uh, while you do this, make space for others to grow as leaders. And if you are an aspiring leader, talk to fellow leaders and see what you can do to get there. And being a leader in open source can be very hard. So learn to speak the language of execs to justify contributions during your work hours. If you're new to conferences, research beforehand, try to, uh, try to build an agenda, try to find a buddy. Uh, and while contributing, remember to set up success systems with asynchronous communication and localization efforts. And most importantly, be empathetic, be aware, and be kind. Uh, so with all of these OSPO uh, stones in hand, uh, we hope that you can snap away maintainer burnout so you know we don't have in another XC backdoor kind of situation. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for attending this session and we hope that you took away some key ideas uh, to keep in mind so that we can build a glo global open source communities. Thank you. Thank you.